morning. My name is Lisa Geisel. I'm from the UNISA Directorate for Counseling and Career Development. A very warm welcome to all of you who will be attending the session today. Um, we have invited advocate Elizabeth Niva to talk to us about the career opportunities and training with Legal Aid SA. As we are listening to the presentation, please post your questions in the Q&A. Um, Advocate Nivot will be attending to the questions either throughout the session or then at the end of the session. So please keep those questions coming. I'm just going to ask one of my colleagues, Mrs. Mandam Kanya, to officially welcome us to the event and also introduce Advocate Niva to us. Thank you, Mandu. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Why with legal aid, advocate Elizabeth Newwood has been responsible for the supervision and training of candidate legal practitioners. She is also involved in training for legal aid SA and LEAD, which is legal education and training about child's rights and the representation of children. Advocate Elizabeth Newwood is also might also be joined by other colleagues from the same organization. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the podium, the virtual podium, Advocate Elizabeth Nivold. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, I would always like just to switch on my, my camera just to say hello to everyone so that you see my face um, and know who you are talking to. While I'm in the presentation, I'll switch off my camera. It always is better for the connectivity. As um, Ms. Daisel has indicated, we I please post the questions as I am talking. It's easier to deal with your questions as you ask them. Um, as you see the slide, you might have a question. At the end of the presentation, I also leave an opportunity for questions and answers if you don't like feeling like posting a, a question in the Q&A. Then also in advance, I want to apologize for my dogs. Um, I'm working from home today and in the two years and two and a half years of COVID, I have not yet been able to teach them not to bark while I'm busy with presentations. So I do apologize in advance. Um, but um, yeah, so please ask questions. Um, the presentation is there to give you an overview, um, but I'm sure you have lots of questions about maybe working for legal aid or just in terms of the profession that you want to go into, that you have some questions. So please, um, please take part. So I'll just go to the slideshow. Give me a moment so that I can start with it. OK, so as Hazel um, has indicated that I, I work for legal aid and I've been working there since 2004. Um, and then I started off as a legal practitioner and since then I've um, after a year I moved into management and as manager I have been managing candidate attorneys and now we call them used to call them CAs but now we call them candidate legal practitioners um, in the 12 years that I've been um, with, um, with legal aid to so and that's why I say ask questions in terms of what do you know or you want to know about working for legal aid. So just the, the, the purpose of the presentation is to tell you a bit more about legal aid. Um, what do we want from you in terms of if you want to apply working for legal aid? Because a, a lot of times and you'll see as we go through the presentation, working for legal aid is not for everyone. It's a certain you must have a, a, a liking for litigation. Um, and also an understanding of compliance and of um, deadlines um, and those kind of things. And that is not always in everybody's makeup to, to do that. So, but as we go along, you'll see um, what I'm talking about. Okay, so just what is legal aid? A lot of times we get that question about what is legal aid South Africa? So Legal Aid is the largest law firm in, in Africa. Um, we employ about 2,000 um, more or less uh, um, legal qualified uh, of lawyers. Let's call them lawyers to make it easier. We are a statutory body. So what does that mean? You'll see later on that 
in terms of the constitution, all accused have a right to legal representation at state expense. So that is where we come in. And now recently we have a Legal Aid South Africa Act that gives us our powers. And from act, that act, there's regulations and the manual. So a manual, the manual would be more the practical steps of how we do things in legal aid. So again, if you work for legal aid, we're going to expect you to understand the manual, to understand when legal aid can be given, when legal aid is not available, because ultimately you're going to be one of the brand ambassadors for legal aid, and you need to be able to ask questions, answer questions if somebody in court comes up to you and say, oh, can I get legal aid? Then you must be able to, to say yes or no. So those answers you'll find in the manual. And then also, where do we get our money from? And I think maybe that's why people are sometimes a bit confused about legal aid. So all we get our money as part of the state funding. So the tax money that everybody is paying, that is where we get our funding from. But otherwise, we a law firm like any other law firm. The only difference is that we are employed um, by, let's call it my by the state. We are part of the state institution. And that's the only difference. So our clients don't pay fees, where in a private law firm, they, they generate the incomes through fees. And as I said, South Africa, the Legal Aid South Africa was put in place um, to comply with the constitutional mandate. So we in the constitution, I'm talking about the constitutional mandate the whole time. So section 35 of the constitution deals with detained persons and persons accused of um, a crime. And you will see that everybody has a right to a fair trial and also to state representation at or legal representation at state expense. And then section 28 and section 34. So when it comes to section 28, it will say that children are also entitled to legal representation at state expense. And this case law that says that legal aid is the best institution that can provide legal representation to children. So you'll find we represent children in the children's court, but also what we call the child justice court. So to differentiate between the two is always the easiest to say, the children's court deals with children in need of care. So those are the children that are neglected or abused, be it physically or emotionally. And then your child justice court is the court for children that is in conflict with the law. So the children that commit crimes, instead of putting them into a mainstream criminal court system, they are dealt with in the child justice court. And that's also where our constitutional mandate is to say that we must represent children in there child justice court. So a lot of times in terms of working for legal aid as a candidate legal practitioner, you will find that you might work in a child justice court. Some of the bigger courts like the Pretoria, Johannesburg, your bigger magistrate courts have dedicated child justice courts, but other courts deal with them sort of as part of a daily court system, but in other courts. So you might as a candidate attorney or a CLP deal with children in the conflict of the law um, and then also access to courts. You'll see later on we look at the statistics um, of what kind of work we do and then I'll, I'll speak to that. So why do we exist? I think you've already got the idea that we are there to give people access to justice, be independent. Now that's also a lot of times where people are uncomfortable with legal aid because they think that because we are funded by the state, then we are not independent, but we are independent. Yes, we get our money from um, a certain department or through the through the Department of Justice, but that does not make us part of them, that we are independent functioning from them, from lawyers for human rights. We have our own act, we have our own mandates, we have our own regulations and our own manual. Also, we are there for the indigent and the vulnerable. So if it comes especially to the civil work, you'll see that if you ever work for us, that that is where our focus lies with women and children and the elderly, to, for especially in, in, in terms of civil work. And you'll see later on that there's, a, there's still, we need to 
say well, what is our focus in terms of civil work because otherwise we don't have the capacity to deal with all the civil work that come our way so we say okay but we are there for the indigent and the vulnerable being in this case women children the elderly disabled landless now also which is not part of this presentation because it opened only happened now recently we have now been mandated to deal with all the land claims so Parliament has given us extra money to open up a land claims units throughout the country that will now take over from the land, um, I think they call rural development, um, the land claims. So we will be assisting the, um, the public to process the land claims and take the matter to court if necessary. So again, that idea of indigent, and, and that's also sometimes where it becomes difficult because people hear they're entitled to legal aid. But yes, but for the indigent. So what is in this? Why do we determine that? We have a means test. So if you, it not, it's not only necessary if you're unemployed, but if you have an income, but it is within our range of, um, say, we have a rebate um, of 7,400 Rand. So if you earn an income, let's say 5,000 Rand, you apply for legal aid, we apply that rebate of 7,400, and then you are left with a negative balance, and therefore you qualify for legal aid. So yes, you're entitled to legal aid, but you must also qualify for legal aid and that we do the means test for. Again, as a, um, a candidate legal practitioner in the court, being the face of legal aid in the court, it's important that you understand that there is a but. Yes, you can get legal aid, but you must qualify because we are not there for the person that earns 30 or 40 or 50,000 rand a month. We are there for the indigent. So like all organizations, we have a, a vision and mission and, a, um, and values. So the values here is more, it, it is the important part of, of this slide um, because the vision and the mission is, is not always something that everybody remembers and they don't always understand where it fits in. But maybe if you want to, be, if you're called for an interview with legal aid and you usually are asked why are you a why would you fit into the organization? It will be good to remember one of these a vision or a mission to say, well, that is why you're a good candidate to work for Legal Aid. But the values is important. Uh, the passion for justice, Ubuntu, integrity, accountability, service excellence, people and planet focused. So how do, what do we mean planet focused? So for example, um, all about recycling, sustainability. So that's part of our programs. You see, is how can we save in terms of paper, in terms of stationery, recycling. So those are the projects that we say planet focus. Service excellence, a big emphasis at the moment on that. We could also call it customer service for uh, another word, service excellence. Again, working for legal aid, you are going to be expected to be able to give your clients regular feedback that they know what's happening, when it's happening, how it's happening, why it's happening. It's a big emphasis currently in the organization um, that there must be that communication, that client service. Just because you are a lawyer and the clients are indigent or vulnerable, it doesn't mean that they're not entitled to the same customer service or service excellence as a paying um, client. And I think, unfortunately, there is this perception sometimes with the public yard that I'm going to get a lesser service because the lawyers, um, some of the, the places will still call us Mahala lawyers, which, uh, you know, if it's, it doesn't speak of, of service excellence. And that is something that we pride ourselves on to say, no, it doesn't matter. You're not paying us, but we're giving you the same service. Accountability, our current CEO is a big um, believer in consequence management. So to say that, yes, you know, my, I'm, I'm as head of office as, as Tembisa's local office, I have responsibilities and I must be accountable for those. But 
if somebody in the office also had to do something and they didn't do it, there's also a consequence management to that. So that idea of accountability goes from, yes, from the top, but also down to the bottom. So that idea that everybody has a little bit of accountability in all the steps um, what of what must be done and also realizing and and that's why I say you must be a certain type of person. We have a business plan that we implement every year and you also have a part to play in, in that business plan and implementing that business plan. We also subscribe to the UN sustainability goal to say to promote the rule of law at national and international level and ensure equal access to justice for all. So you'll see that access to for justice for all, you'll find also as a theme in our vision and our mission and one of our values, but we also subscribe um, to that. So as I, I've sort of hinted at that in terms of criminal and civil cases, we, if we look at just at the courts we appear in, in and we start at the lower courts, it's your maintenance courts, your domestic violence courts, is usually on the same, let's call them family courts. The children's court is part of that. So in all magistrate courts, you will hear that somebody always talks about family courts. Um, so what would be the family courts? The family courts are usually your children's court, your maintenance court, and your domestic violence court. So those are your family courts. Then your district court, regional courts, domestic court, High Court, Supreme Court of Appeal and Constitution, Constitutional Court. So those are the courts we appear in. As a candidate legal practitioner, you only are allowed to appear in the, let's call it the lower courts, so being maintenance, children's court, district court and domestic violence court. You can get right of appearance to appear in the regional court, but as working for legal aid, you will appear in the, in the lower courts um, alone. So what can we offer you? As a candidate, if you work for us, um, we you get annual leave, you get family responsibility leave, you get study leave. So in, especially for you guys, study leave is important. So you get study leave and you also get special leave for you if you want to attend your, uh, what do they call it nowadays? Um, I call it law school, but I think they've changed the name now in terms of the act. But so we, we give you the study leave for, for studying for the board exams. But if you then do your practical law school, um, we also assist you with that with leave. So or annual leave. And then also we always close over December. So usually around the 16th of December, just before the public holiday, up until either the 5th, the 6th or the 7th of January. Um, usually one of those dates we open up again, so we for December we close down. All the offices close down, all the national offices, everybody closed down and for, for those December. And then we run a skeleton staff just for bail applications and the first appearance. Then part of also a flexible work arrangement. So, sorry, that's very much risk based. So we will look at you and say, okay, but you're a brand new CLP, so you can't dive at the beginning necessarily have um, days that you can go directly from home to court and from court to home. Now we want to see you every morning. We want to make sure that you're okay. We want to make sure that you understand what's happening. You understand what you must do. But as you then are more senior in the two years that you work for us, the idea of a flexible work arrangement is, is part of that. Then also you get group life cover. There's an employee wellness program. And what does that mean? So the as legal aid as an employer, we also say, yes, the work that we do that you do is stressful, is not nice. You deal with rape, murder, robbery um, kind of matters in your courts. So we also in, we we are worried about you. So we have put certain programs in place. One of them is this um, we have a full time industrial psychologist that you can book sessions with and have or what we call a debriefing with them and say, look, I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that. Also, they now do vicarious trauma workshops. So once a quarter or once a month, they will have virtually like we are now, they will have a, a group of people saying, OK, we want to share our our stress at that moment in time 
what we are dealing with. And it's always interesting to look at the, the comments that the people put and then there comes a, a little bit of advice from a colleague or the psychologist can help. So, and it's no, it's not long sessions, is that just idea, the group of people that's coming together on that specific day that you feel you today I need to I need to talk to a few of my colleagues um, so that opportunity is also there for you because as I say and I'm repeating myself and I'm going to repeat it again and again working for legal aid is stressful working for legal aid takes a certain attitude which is of compliance which of meeting of deadlines completing of web pages and that is just your admin work that is not the court work so it can become difficult and also our clients or your client seldom if ever is going to turn around and thank you for doing what you are doing they are just interested in either getting a suspended sentence being not guilty or getting the shortest prison sentence possible if at all and if they are in that is if they get that then they're happy and, and thank you is not always part of their vocabulary so you need to be able to say okay i'm doing this not because of the thank yous and the gratitude i'm just, i'm getting from my clients because i feel like this is what i want to want to do i want to help people that are indigent and vulnerable but somewhere you must then go to and say sure this is really getting to me i'm now i'm fed up and that's why we have this vicarious trauma sessions that you can just um, say what you um, what you feel like or just put it out there so that somebody can help you there's also once a year but also throughout the year we have an hiv awareness campaign and also a voluntary counseling um, program and a peer educator training so again you'll see as part of your um um, your employment is that we're not just going to send you out there. And say, oh, OK, bye bye. See you this afternoon. No, we're going to first train you, help you, give you people to help you to prepare you to to go to court. So just a quick overview of Legal Aid as an organization to say that we are countrywide. We have 64 local offices, so those are your let me call them main offices in your bigger cities and towns and then you also have satellite offices the one satellite office that i always remember is prisca which is in the you'll see uh, on the actually on the on the slide there's prisca um there's a satellite office there um, i always remember the one in bochum in limpopo so in your smaller places where there is a court but there's not necessarily a, a, a regional court or a big court that's that justifies a, a full local office but we need a footprint near to the the office you'll find this a uh, little satellite office um, that that is the the practitioners will be there and then go from court instead of the bigger office which if i go back to prisca the big office that it will fall under is then um if you look at the distance is uppington so you might but so you can um, sometimes they travel the distances. I know in the Eastern Cape, there's not always a satellite office, but they from the main office, they will travel easily or 100 or 200 kilometers to get to the court. So again, think about legal aid. You know, if you work in a province like the Eastern Cape or the West or the Northern Cape, even the Free State, the that idea of you have to travel it's also going to be part of your of your job so your colleagues are all going to go home at four o'clock you're only going to leave court at four o'clock you're going to get at the office at half past five and then you must still do admin because the idea of now was on the road traveling is um it's not an um, not an excuse and then six provincial offices and one national office while i'm talking about the provinces and while we see it if you want to apply for legal aid, oh, sorry, not for legal aid, sorry, um, apply for a position, you will see you can choose where you want to go. And unfortunately, a lot of people choose Gauteng because, you know, they maybe this is where they're from or where they're comfortable. Um, that, But unfortunately, most of the applications come into Gauteng. So you are part of a big group where we need to choose then, say, just 50 of the group for placement so if you can at all pos if possible choose one of the other provinces you'll see 
Um, yes, you, it might not be as nice as Gauteng, it might not be as nice and busy, but your chances of getting placement are bigger than putting your name in the pool of, of Gauteng, where everybody wants to go to, or your, big, your bigger cities, Durban, Cape Town, Polokwane, um, Bombela, those are places usually everybody wants to go there. So I was earlier saying about the staff contingent. So we are 2,400 staff in total. So I was lying. Um, so only about 1,600 1, are legal staff and the rest are support staff and then our paralegals. So our paralegals in terms of our structures are those people that see our clients the first. So if you have, we have what we call walk-in clients. So that paralegal is the person that would see the walk-in client first time to hear what the problem is, to do the means test, to see if it's something that we can do. And if you can't assist that client, also not just sending a client away, but say, okay, maybe go to this place or that place that is more appropriate than, than coming to legal aid. So the paralegals play a very important role in terms of our structures. Um, advocate Nivert. Yeah. Sorry, um, there are quite a number of questions. I'm wondering oh, if you would okay. take some time now. To yeah, no, no, those. let's do that. <laughs> Let me stop the slideshow. Otherwise, we lose time of the. Um, oh, we track of the, all the questions. I cannot. Oh, wait, it's loading. Let me see. Um, published. Let me see. Oh, OK. Um, phew, OK, let me go back. Um, let me see, John. Um, let me start with the first question to say, is there an age limit? Um, no, but we we must retire at 60 in terms of our current HR policies. So if, um, let me also switch on my camera, then it's a bit easier. Um, so if you 59 and a half, you can realize that um, that's not going to work because we need to be able to employ you for two years to do your complete your your um, legal training. So that's the only limit that there is at the moment is that you need to have enough years before 60, which is our compulsory um, retirement age. So when Decile, you ask, can you choose a specialization to work in legal aid? Unfortunately not. Um, the only specialization, if I can call it like that, is that our bigger offices, Pretoria, Johannesburg, Cape Town, Bloemfontein, Durban, um, Port Elizabeth, Umbela, Polokwane, Peter Maritzburg, there's 13 offices that have civil units. And in those civil units, they have dedicated candidate um, practitioners, candidate legal practitioners. So you will do only civil work, whereas you would end up in, let's say, where I am in Tembisa, you have your biggest job will be to go to the criminal court every day. We're going to give you civil work to do, but it will be a small percentage of the work that you do. So, and that's also something that you need to consider if you want to apply for for working at legal aid is to say that can I work in a criminal court every day? It becomes a bit repetitious because certain areas, for example, in Kempton Park, one of the courts also in, that falls under Timbisa, they have a, a lot of shoplifting. So you're going to deal with a lot of shoplifting every day. And the question you have to ask yourself, is that what you want to do? Will you be able it for two years? Because working for legal aid, there's not going to really be anything different um, that you're going to do, except you might be given some civil work to do. But if you can, if you want to then work in a civil unit, you're going to do a variety of civil work at least. But um, as I said, there's only 13 offices um, countrywide that have civil units. What kind of person succeeds at legal aid to be there? <laughs> That's why I say, I always say to the, the people that, uh, first of all, you must like court work. And I know it's difficult for you guys maybe to answer that question because how do you know you're a student? And that's why I say it's very important that you take time. And I know all of you are busy and most probably full-time employed. 
um, and that you don't always have the opportunity, but go and sit in a court. Um, pick the nearest court to you, nearest to you, or the nearest local office. Go to them and say, look, I have a week's vacation leave time. Can I come and shadow one of your lawyers? So that's the first question. E can you function in a court every day? It is not nice. A lot of courts are filthy. A lot of courts don't have water every day. Um, like the Tembisa court, for example, they don't always have water. They pump the water up into a tank. If the tank is finished, it's finished for the day. Then there's no water in the court. Um, sometimes, um, like now in the past month in Tembisa, there's riots. So you go to the court. Um, you don't always know if the road is going to be clean, if you're going to be able to get to the court. So it's the court is, is not a nice environment to so go and find out if that is what you really want to do. Except for that, there's a lot of admin. So I think 50% of your work working for legal aid is it's court work. So you must be able to work in a court and function in a court. But the other 50% is admin. So you must be able to diarize a file, work on a file properly, gift lines, feedback, complete web pages, meet deadlines, attend training sessions. Um, so you must be able to balance that. Yes, we pay you really good salary, and I think that's what all of you also want to know. The salary, we start around 13, 14,000 rand a month. So the salary is is quite competitive in comparison with a lot of other law firms. But I always say that for that 14,000 rand, we ask that you give us all your time and all your commitment. I, what is nice, I think, about legal aid is that we, I'm sure some of you might have friends that work for these big firms like in Santon or Pretoria, the big established firms. Those poor candidate legal practitioners work Saturday, Sundays. If they have to work until eight o'clock, that's also so be it. So that's the one nice thing about legal aid is that we are a bit more. Um, I always want to say time in your Saturdays and your I'm not going to say your Saturdays always, but your Sundays is your Sundays and you start at eight and you finish kind of at four or five o'clock depends on where you're situated. So yes, we you work hard in the hours, but I think it's less intrusive than if you work in any of the other uh, bigger law firms. To be there, I hope that answers your your questions. OK, Franz, how many cases do you deal with annually? So we have targets. For you guys that's going to work in the district court, we have a target of 250 cases. So at any given time, you will have 250 cases and you need to finalize 250 cases. It's usually less because nowadays the district uh, in the criminal courts, the state do not place so many cases on the roll again. So they're not prosecuting so many people as in the past. But you should have at any given time have about 150 files. So our target is also for finalization for every new file you open, you must close a file. So that one, um, that finalization rate of one. It sounds a lot, but remember in a criminal, in a criminal environment, let's say you're in court today with five cases. So one might be just for disclosure of the docket. And the other might be for mediation. The one might be placed for trial and the other one is for you made presentations to the state. So yes, you might have five cases, but then different stages. And then some of them might be finalized and you can close it or some of them might be postponed for a next date. You're still waiting for the you're still waiting for the docket. So you're going to postpone for two weeks. You're going to write that date on your file. You're going to diarize it. That file go, goes into your cabinet. Remember, in the two weeks leading up to that, you're not doing anything on that file. You're just waiting for your next court date. Yes, you might have to give your client a, a quick reminder of the court date, but your client was also in court, so he or she also knows the next court date. So it sounds a lot, 150, but if you think about how you deal with criminal files, it is not that many. 
150 civil files is it's something totally different because then you in charge of those files you must diarize you must consult you must draft you must go to court so that is a different ball game altogether but 150 200 files is more or less what you what you're looking at can you see le um for the tips um Yeah, I think what I said before that you look at things like the vision, the uh, vision, the values, so you can speak to, you know, a lot of questions in, in an interview, if you've ever been to interviews, is um, is that why are you a fit um, for, for the organization that you are applying for? And then it would also be helpful if you can say, yeah, I know, you know, I, I'm a people centered person or I'm a, I service to clients is important to me or in the indigent and the vulnerable. So I look at those things that you can speak to the values and the mission and the vision of the organization, because that's part of the, um, of why you fit in, because we do ask also the question, are you a cultural fit in for the organization? Also, there is some technical questions. So let me think of something now. Let's say, what is the requirements of a 112 guilty plea in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act? So we do test your legal knowledge also, because look, we're not going to penalize you if you don't get a, it, that question 100 percent correct we just need to understand if somehow you do have an idea what we are asking you and you can even if you can say okay you are the criminal procedure guilty pleas then at least if you can talk to the idea of a guilty plea then we have an idea okay we can see you can think on your feet because remember ultimately if you want to be a litigator standing in a court every day you're going to be engaged by a magistrate, you're going to be engaged by a prosecutor. You do not know from one day to another what they're going to ask you. So that that ability of standing on your feet and dealing with whatever question comes your way from the magistrate. Also, a magistrate is not always a nice person. Um, some of them uh, get a bit of an ego when they are appointed magistrates. So they can be very condescending. Some of them can be just downright rude um, and they will make you feel like you're small and stupid and that you actually don't know anything. So that idea that the ability to say that a bit of emotional intelligence to say, you know what, it's not about me. Um, and also ultimately, remember if it's about your client. So yes, the magistrate is going to be nasty to you, it's going to be rude to you, um, but Ultimately, the you there for the client. So whatever comes your way, you must deal with it just in the interest um, of your client. So that uh, I think to answer your question, hopefully, um, can you see that answers your question in terms of what you need to do. Anonymous. Can candidate attorneys write the attorney's admission exam through legal aid? Well, I'm not sure what you mean through legal aid, but in the two years that you are, will do your articles with us or your, sorry, now they call it something else, vocational training, you will have four opportunities to write board exams. It's usually February, August, February, August, and we do allow you to go and write exams. So yes, as if you work for legal aid, we do give you the opportunity to write the exams and we pay for you once. So if you want to go and write paper one and paper two. And you pass paper one and paper two and the next exam you want to write paper three and four, we will pay for each paper once. But if you fail paper one and paper two on your first attempt, we are not going to pay for you to write it again and again and again. No. So we do assist financially. <coughs> Sorry. With the exam, exam also. Dupio, how long do people usually work at Legal Aid? Well, I started in 2004. Um, so there's a, a large part of the workforce at this stage is we, we jokingly call ourselves, we have asset tags. You know, you're an asset of the organization because you worked so, for it so long. But we have 
uh, so a large part of the workforce is the guys that started middle of 2000s and then you have a lot of so 2004 2005 so sort of when the new legal aid started let me call it that then you have a lot of intake around the 2012 so sort of those areas so there's a there's established i think the the one thing people realize that if you like working for legal aid you usually stay um despite the you know do x y and z do it on time complete this web page complete that web page it's it's a good organization to work for the people that leave quickly is the ones that realize mm -mm, this compliance ticking of boxes completing of web pages um is not for me so they they leave very quickly but in terms of a crp position i mean that's a two-year contract you'll see if we go back to the presentation there is uh there is opportunities to stay in the organization once you've done with the two years, but I, unfortunately, I mean, for for candidate legal practitioners, it's a two years. Um, it's a two year contract. Um, so anonymous, what are the different roles or job opportunities one can do after being? Uh, so I'm going to I'll get to that in the presentation. So if we can just have that stand when, uh, stand over. When is the next intake? OK, that's an important question. I'm sure all of you have. So we changed it a little bit now in the past year. We usually had a rolling intake, so you could at any time apply for a position and then your name will go into a pool of candidates. Now we've changed it because it's just. You we, ultimately we sit with thousands and thousands of CVs that it's just impossible to really process properly. So what we've now done is the um, February 2023. We will do the intake. And then it closes so it's open for a month we do the intake and you must have your llb already when you apply in february you must be able to prove to us that you've completed your llb not in your third year not busy with your fourth year you must be done that's also the other requirement and the other requirement is we have a no i mustn't lie a 60 percent academic requirement so your average must be a 60 percent so those but you're in the intake is only in february another anonymous does legal aid have back work or are students allowed to come and job shadow yes we the only thing with that is that we um we don't have a centralized program for that so you must visit our website um, and it will be at the end of the slideshow will be all our information. So what I usually say to the people is go to our website. You've seen now when I showed you the map, there's offices really countrywide. Pick an office. Go to our website and say, oh, OK, I've picked up. I'm choosing Uppington for an example. Call Uppington local office and say to them, I'm Maybe that you go there for vacations. I'm there. Can I come and job shadow somebody for a week? So it's a very much it's up to you. You need to call the office that you can comfortably go to and, and shadow somebody. Vocational work the same. Unfortunately, prior to COVID and you know, COVID has changed a lot of things. We had a centralized program for volunteering. But because of COVID, there was this feeling also that it's very risky now to for to take in volunteers. Because we are exposing you to a possible infection and, and, and possible getting very ill. So that program was discontinued, but that's why I say it's now very much on the local office level. If um, if you want to um, do a vocational program or training or volunteer or job shadowing. So just you will have to do a bit of homework. So the other question, if it is the minimum law quality, can I work as at the same time study? Well, if you have a qualification for a paralegal, yes, and you get full time employment because a paralegal is a permanent position. So yes, if you if there's a it's a if, if there's an opening for a paralegal, you applied, you're successful, we employ you as a permanent employee then you can also qualify for a bursary. So there's lots of paradigms in the organization that is studying towards their LLB 
and then legal aid has bursaries that assist the paralegals to obtain their LLB. The problem then becomes that a lot of the paralegals then have LLBs, they then want to do their articles or vocational training, sorry. And there's then that a lot of them, I know this debate of, because then you have to resign your permanent position being a paralegal and go into a contract position for a two year contract position being the, the candidate attorney position. And there's also then no guarantee that once you're done with your two years in the organization, there's going to be a position open for the for going back as a permanent employee. But yes, if you can get appointed as a paralegal, you can study towards your LLB and we have bursaries for the employees. If one gets admitted as an advocate or their job, yes, well, I'm an advocate, so it's just um, we require pupillage. So if you're admitted as an advocate, we need some kind of um, guarantee that you did undergo training. But I mean it now in terms of the new legal um, LPC Act of legal practice, um, legal practitioner act. That is something that you have to do in any way. But yes, that, that, that you can work in a criminal court, you can work in a civil court, so that's that's not a problem. What qualifications required for paralegal? Um, I think they call it, shoot, and you guys at the university will know better than I, what they call it, but why do I think it's just a legal certification or BA law or something like that? But yes, um, there is a, just double, make double sure with the, with the ladies, I think they'll be better be able to tell you what is those quali that qualification called. I know UNISA have one, and then the, in Pretoria, the Tawani University of Technology used to have one. I'm not sure if they still have, but I'm sure the University of Pretoria will also have a, a, a course that you can do. I have applied many times in the past and did not get. Yeah, so that's why I said um, I think that uh, I, that should have answered your question in terms of yes, now we now only doing February. The system is once you've applied, the system generates an email. Um, I'm told I've never seen it. But the email then tells you we've received your application. If you don't hear anything as from us in three months time, you can deem your application unsuccessful. So also in the past, people were advised to keep on applying. So if you have submitted your CV and there's nothing for three months, submit it again. But now because we are moving to only opening the system for February, that's it, that should not be a problem now going forward. And uh, Sinalami, um, yeah, how many candidates do we take in annually? Again, we, it, it, it is a, um, how do I want to explain it? So let's say at any given time, there is somebody leaving. Because let's say, for example, in Tembisa, the local office where I am, we have seven candidate attorneys, but they did not always, all of them start on the same date. So at any given time, one of them are leaving. So what we do is with the CVs we get during the intake of February, we then look at the people that meet the requirements. You, you go through a process of an online assessment and interview, and if you're successful in all of this, your name is placed in a pool. So let's say, for instance, you said Gauteng, and you were successful Gauteng. So your name is going to go into that pool now. So let's say now, for example, Benoni has a, a position opening. They will say to our HR department, look, I have a candidate legal practitioner leaving. Do you have somebody for me? Then you'll be offered the position. Do you want to go and work in Benoni's? Maybe Benoni was your third choice when you applied for, but then you can say, oh, okay, wait, I'm waiting so long. Let me go to Benoni and then the position is offered. So it's, it's difficult to put a number to it. It is really because the leaving of candidate legal practitioners is an ongoing thing. And that's why we like to have the pool because then at any, we know at any given time we have people that are ready, that has been screened, that has done the interviews, everything is ready, they can just be offered a position. And also we have a policy of, which is part of the training, is that you will overlap for two months with the person you are replacing. So I 
in Tembisa, I will see, okay, somebody is leaving at the end of September, or oh, sorry, end of October, then I'm going to say, okay, please, one September, please make sure I have a replacement candidate legal practitioner, and then you will shadow that person that you're going to replace. You will shadow for two months. Again, that idea that we're just not going to take you in and throw you into a court. We really try to expose you to environment. Um, I would like to ask if a failing module is a disadvantage. No, you know, ultimately that's why I say we look at the average. So what is your average uh, um, at the end of the final year? I think all life happens. Sometimes you don't pass a module. Um, there's, there, there can be a gazillion reasons why you don't pass. So I can't go and say, oh no, sure, no, mm -mm, anonymous. Mm -mm, yeah, clearly you're not a good candidate because you failed the module. So that's, you know, that per se is no, not going to disqualify, you know. What are some of the opportunities one can acquire in legal aid if you have a completed diploma in law? You see, I think that's where the paralegal comes in, that we won't be able to register your contract. Remember, the being a candidate legal practitioner, yes, we employ you, but we also have to register you with the LPC, the Legal Practice Council. And there we look at the Legal Practitioners Act that says to be registered as a vocational learner, you need to meet certain requirements. And unfortunately, one of those requirements is an LLB. So with the diploma in law as, as an employer, mostly what we will be able to do is a is a paralegal, which is then a permanent position and not a two year position. OK, George, what's the salary per month? As I said, so for your first year, we pay you more or less about 13,000 Rand. And then if you complete your first year and we're happy and you do what you're supposed to do, then in the second year, your salary is increased to about 15,000 Rand. So this it depends on on the year two from year one to year two. And then the only thing that, because as I say, you have this two month overlap. Now in that two month overlap, we pay you a 5,000 Rand salary. It's just because remember the person you're replacing is still employed. So we're still paying that salary. So in that two year, oh, two months, not sorry, two years, two months, we pay you five. But as soon as the person that's leaving that you're replacing, then your full salary will, will kick in. Um, so Africana, you say good morning. Since it's difficult to find articles in vacation work, do you encourage graduates with no experience? Yeah, look, it is not something like it's not doing pupillage. I know with the pupillage they want you to have prior experience, but with the vocational training, you just need LLB, meet the requirements in terms of 60, have 60 uh, percent, then you can apply. So prior experience is not a requirement. I think sometimes just for yourself, it will it will be easier, uh, maybe in a work environment that you know, you know, I can I'm good with this, I'm not good with that, working with people, but that's not a requirement from us in terms of recruitment. I'm just saying, you know, in terms of working in a, um, especially I see the guys that really suffer with the courts and the the the, the organizational fit is the guys that come directly from a university that that has exposure yet to to how you know a bit of people skills if i can and call it that but it's not a formal requirement no remember also being a lawyer being a lawyer in legal aid being a lawyer if you want to go and do the bar be a lawyer in upsa want to be a legal advisor um, if you want to com do commercial law it's a people's profession. You must be able to work with people. So that idea of not taking anything personal and clients, be it paying clients, be it legal aid clients, get rude. The other day I had a client storming out of my office telling me I come from Pretoria and all people are corrupt that come from Pretoria. Does it help I get upset to him? No, I just said, OK, sir. OK, bye. Enjoy your day. Um, the other time a client told me I must change my attitude. So I said, okay, that's fine. I'll change my attitude. Okay. 
getting involved in arguments, um, taking it personally. Um, so, it's not, so that's the question, and, and, and as I say, not only for legal aid, I think legal aid is a bit worse, because by the time that the client comes to you, they've usually been sent from pillar to post, they have paid somebody money, which they don't have, and that person didn't help them, and now they're with you. Now they look at you, and you must now solve that problem now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, now. So that idea of you need to explain to them, this is a process, yes, it's old in your heart, and in your world, it's an old problem, but it's a new problem in the books of legal aid. We will look at it. We understand you're frustrated. So that's why I say coming, working for legal aid, if you have a bit of exposure to working with people, it's helpful for you. Um, it will make you, it, it, the adapt, adapting in the circumstances will make it easier for you. Mr. F. Do you accommodate? Yes, so we have, we do accommodate um, people with disability. That's also one of our programs. Um, we have had a long time, we had a practitioner in our Alex office that was, um, that was blind. He actually went to court, he ran files. So he, and I think, and I think luckily nowadays, the technology is making it easier and easier also for somebody with a disability to function. I think the courts might still be stuck in the old ways a bit and they can become a challenge, but in terms of the organization, we do encourage people to apply. So anonymous 20, when I said February 2023, it will open up again. Um, so Bali, you ask if you work um, if you work alone or with an attorney. So if once you and, and most most courts have what we call a channelization court. So not to bore you too much with that, but the channelization court or reception court is a court where they receive all the new cases for that court. So it's a very busy court, especially like on a Monday, all the people that they, the police arrested over the weekend is then brought to court and then they appear in that court. So a lot of the local offices, you will work with the admitted attorney in that court for at least six months. That idea of getting your court ready, of understanding how things work, because there it's volume, then you do postponements, you do police, you do bail. So that idea of training you, and then you go into a trial court, and there you're on your own. But remember, you're never really on your own. Um, I mean, again, going back to the poor Priska, and I'm always speaking on poor Priska, but if you're in a small court, you might be really on your own, own, own. But if any other court, be it in Bezak, in Tim Park, Pretoria, Johannesburg, Hillbrow, you in a court building and your colleague is next door. Um, the admitted attorney is maybe a floor up or floor down from where you are. And there's always, and again, there's, I suppose there will be a magistrate that is going to refuse, but a lot of the magistrate will say, it will say if you say to them, your worship, so I, I really, I'm not sure about this um, step that I need to take now or the advice I need to give my client, can the matter stand down for a moment or two? I just need to um, take an instruction. And there's not a lot of magistrates that's going to refuse. So then you can quickly run out of court, go down to your, go up to your colleague, quickly chat um, and then come back. So you're never alone. And also nowadays, luckily with COVID, we all in the, all the offices, we have WhatsApp groups that all the lawyers in the office are on the group and even now still you have somebody that you can see they're sitting in court they're quickly posting a question on the whatsapp group oh, guys could you help me yeah this is what's happening and there's always somebody in a big office that is answering the question and given guidance so yes you're alone but never alone in terms of we leave you destitute no and if you have a question nobody's there to answer you Okay, so 250 cases, as I say, on a continuous basis. So at any given time, if I have to draw your pending list, there should be 250 cases. 
with the criminal cases it's difficult now because you're not we're not in charge of how many cases they will put in your court they you might have a quiet court where you at any given time might only have 30 cases if you go to a bigger court they're going to carry 200 cases but it's at any given time that is what your pending list will be but that's why i say don't Remember, you're not going to work on 250 files on a day. Don't don't look at the number and be afraid. It is cases that is, there's 30 days in a month. So those 250 cases are going to be spread out over a month or two months or three month period, depending on where the matter is at. Is it a part of matter? Is it a new matter? Is it for mediation? Is it for disclosure? So it sounds a lot, but don't. Don't see in front of your eyes this 250 files in a pile and you have to work on all of them on the same day. No, it's spread out, but that's just the target. But the criminal, it's it's difficult because we're not in control of how many cases they decide to prosecute in a criminal court. It's more the civil cases we are in, in, in charge or in control of how many cases we take in. Ishmael, you said, does doing article through legal aid limit you in finding? Um, look, a lot of, I can tell you this, a lot of the guys that has worked for legal aid as candidate attorneys or candidate legal practitioners, they are very sought after by the NBA, the National Prosecuting Authority. So a lot of our guys after the two years are picked up by the NBA because they are impressed in the way that we train and also just your exposure in terms of a, a criminal court. So civil, we will expose you to maintenance, domestic violence, divorces, maybe a claim signing and money. So there it's going to be limited. So the question you will have to ask yourself that is if your mind or if your wish is commercial law, do you see yourself as this big commercial attorney one day drafting contracts for big companies or mining companies, then don't start off with legal aid because then any other further employer is going to look at your CV and say, mm -mm, no, where's the commercial experience here? Because remember, we don't do commercial work. So that is, I think working for legal aid as a candidate legal practitioner is excellent exposure to court, to dealing with people, to thinking on your feet. So it teaches you a lot of skills. But if you want specific skills in terms of drafting of contracts, drafting of commercial documents, no, don't even start with legal aid because that's going to limit your employment um, going forward. Do you have an aid restriction for paralegals? Um, to go back to my first answer was that the paralegal is a permanent employee, so there you must retire at 60. So you can also think that if you're 59, you, are, you we might not employ you because you're going to be there for six months and then you have to retire. So it's just, there's no age restriction per se. Oh, okay. Um, anonymous now, I don't have a family. I don't have children. Um, so, yeah, I can't answer your question. I can just say that I know a lot of, uh, I think in, in legal aid, there is an emphasis nowadays on a more a work-life balance, and it is something that you have to work on yourself. I'm very bad with that. Like, for example, this afternoon at half past four, I'm going to consult with the child. And then tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock, I'm consulting with the child. So I'm I'm bad with that, but it's something that you have to to be strict on in terms of boundaries, because I think litigation, especially civil litigation, can be very time consuming. You you can easily fall into a habit of leaving the office at four, going home, feeding everyone, and then six or seven o'clock, eight o'clock, when the children is in bed, you sit behind your desk and you work again. And that is your own self-discipline that you need to that you need to um, work on. And also the stress. A lot of people with small children, it's difficult that that switching off, but that is something you will have to have to learn. 
that's legal. I had I have bachelor's paralegal study. Yes, again, um, can you see the 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 paralegals? It's we understand it's an entry level position, if I can call it like that. So we understand that you need to meet the requirement of your qualification. You don't have to have um, experience. W. When do you place the candidates after February? So you, we, I, I think going back to my previous explanation is we can't tell you. It is when and if there's a position open in a local office in the province that you chose. That you would then, if you're successful in terms of the online assessment, in terms of the interview, that you will have to wait then for a position to open and for you to be invited. And then that's why I say try to apply for positions in other places than Gauteng. We, we only have 10 offices in Gauteng. Um, so you can do the math if you say, OK, and also now you're being specific. Let's say you chose Gauteng and you chose Soweto, which is one of the offices in Gauteng, and that's those are the things you chose. Now you must wait for somebody to leave in Soweto, and you don't know in February 2023 really when that is. So when, if you want to sort of make your chances better, try not to choose Gauteng. And then also, if you do choose Gauteng, I think except for our Vereniging office, who, which is really far away from the rest, the rest, the others are really very near to each other because we have Pretoria, Shoshanguwe, Johannesburg, Krugersdorp, Alexander, Tembisa, Soweto, Garankoa. Okay, Garankoa is not maybe not so central. So Garankoa and Vereniging is the two offices that's, um, that's maybe not central. So if you want to work in Gauteng, indicate more than one office. Yes, it might be if you travel, you, you might move, but that's going to increase your chances to, to be placed. OK, anonymous. Yes, I think uh, what I said is in February. Look, again, remember, and that's what you, again, coming back to what I said before, you have an employment contract, which is with legal aid, but you also have a vocational training contract, which we need to register with the Legal Practice Council. They're not going to register your contract if you have pending criminal charges, because say you are found guilty, then you can't be admitted as an attorney. So you might meet all our requirements for employment, but in terms of the Legal Practice Act or the Legal Practitioners Act, there is something stopping you from being admitted as an attorney, and then the LPC is not going to register your contract. And our problem is, remember, we want to put you into a court. And we cannot put you into a court if we can't register your contract, if you can't get a right of appearance. So that's why if there's a pending charge of any kind, it will not be successful because we cannot, it sounds terrible, but we cannot use you for what we want in terms of placing you in a court where you appear um, every day on behalf of, of our clients. Okay, so the salary um, it starts from about 13 and it goes up to 15, 16, depending on in your first year or your second year. Paralegal positions, anonymous, you must go to our website. Again, at the end of the slideshow, you will see the, the web page, but I can also quickly just type it in for you. There you go. Um, then you will you will find the position. There's vacancies. There's a tab for vacancies. Just go there and see if there's paralegal positions available, and then you apply. Um, anonymous Polakwan, in you cannot request. I think maybe I don't know if you hear from here from the beginning to say that if you want to do only civil work, then 
you'll have to try to apply to those area, those 13 offices, Pretoria, Johannesburg, Polokwane, Bombela, Durban, Peter Maritzburg, Cape Town, um, BE, Kimberley, um, that that has civil units that you can do civil only civil work, but otherwise civil you're going to do civil work, but it's going to be a small percentage of your of the work that you do. So you say I'm currently working. So why is it since I'm working even though not in my current job? Well, remember at the end of the day, you're going to, if you, if you're going to start doing your articles, the, 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 your previous experience, say, as an auditor or as a procurement officer or as a compliance officer, doesn't speak to why we're employing you as a candidate legal, candidate legal practitioner. There, we're going to ask you, do you have an LOB? Do you have a 60% average? Are you done? And are you applying within the time? So yes, your previous employment uh, is not going to be relevant. I, I, I'm understanding the, the question because you're going to leave that job to start working um, for as a vocational um, a candidate legal practitioner to be ultimately admitted as an attorney. I can see that I like criminal law more than also auditing bad play role. OK, so if you like criminal law and you think you can stand in a court every day, then sure, yeah, go for it, apply for legal aid, because they, as a candidate legal practitioner, you're going to be in a criminal court every day. You're going to deal with the Criminal Procedure Act every day and um, all the other legislation that goes with it. Anonymous, you ask if you can leave after one year. Well, if you comply with the the Legal Practitioners Act, yes, you can apply, but then you must have completed your board exams and done law school within that time period, and then you can only do a one year contract. But we don't sign, let me say this clearly, we don't sign your one year contracts. We only sign two year contracts. But if you then are admitted within those two years and the court is satisfied and the LPC is satisfied that you meet the requirements and you are admitted on the day that you are admitted, your employment with legal aid will be terminated. Because then you're not a candidate legal practitioner anymore. What if you're awaiting expungement? So you're, it goes to that in terms of if you are waiting, you're not sure about the answer, it's not going to help. Rather wait for the for your answer on the expungement. No, you don't have to have your own car. We comply, we give you a car. That all offices have cars that you go there every morning, you can take a car, you drive with your colleagues, um, as long as you have a, driver, a valid driver's license. Um, and we do make you do a little driver's test so you get into the car with one of our admin officers and we see that you can, that we are satisfied that you can drive. Also, our cars are not automatic, so you need to be able to drive a shift. And I see that's a lot, a big problem nowadays with a lot of the newer candidate legal practitioners. They can't drive stick cars, they can only drive automatic cars. So that's the other problem. Had motor vehicle charges. I don't understand motor vehicle charges. Is it like drunken driving, reckless driving? Because any criminal, remember, a criminal, pending criminal case might lead to a criminal conviction and therefore you won't be able then to admit it as an attorney. So it doesn't really matter what the, the charges are. If it's pending, it's pending and they must first deal with it. After serving articles at the legal aid, do I do you still stay with it? Become an attorney. Um, that's why I say if I look at if I leave the um, I see that's the last question. Lee, uh, Ms. Dysel. I don't know if there's other questions. Um, 
Um, there's just, just one. one. I'm not I'm sure, sure if you can get um, to what if you are awaiting expungement. Yeah, I did answer that one. Oh, yeah. sorry, uh, I missed that. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Now, I just want to go back to my slideshow quickly. Let me switch off my camera. No and let me go to my slideshow because I think the question, the last question was that what if, if, if I want to stay on? So yes. we've already spoken to about this, the salaries, the bonuses, um, the in-house training. So to come back to that question of what if I'm finished and can I stay on? So the answer is yes, it's the, it is possible. While we do it, you'll see that we pride, one of it says here, we pride ourselves on being a high performing organization. So we have a pool. So once you're done with your, your training or your, your candidate, your articles, let's call it articles, it's just easier. And you are were a high performing candidate legal practitioner. We will put your name into the pool for the permanent positions. So I know the question now is what is a high performing candidate legal practitioner? So let me say it like this. If you do what you need to do without being asked, without being reminded, without being late with submissions, we don't have to look for your files. You know where your files are. If I ask you what's happening in a case, you know what's happening in a case. You work on your civil files religiously. You give your clients feedback. You don't let them grow hair and tails and teeth. And then after two years, we, we find your files behind the cabinet and wondering what's happening. So a high performing candidate attorney or legal practitioner is exactly that. You perform better than what we expect from you. You are those little stars that we don't have to beg, threaten uh, or anything to, to do what you need to do. So that's what a high performing um, candidate legal practitioner is. So also you will say, OK, but how do we measure that? So you sign a performance contract. So the performance contract, and that's why I said to you, you there's, it, there's a business plan that you need to implement, and that business plan is in your performance contract. So it's the, what we want from you is not a surprise. It's not a secret. You can sign a performance contract. In that contract, it says you must do this, you must do that, you must do it so many times. You must um, attend this, you must attend that, you must complete this web page. So all of it is clear. And if you do that and you do it well, and you do it in advance without anybody reminding you, then you're a high performing candidate legal practitioner. And then we can place your name into the pool for permanent, um, permanent employment. We we'll also give you uh, mentors. I just want to as a thing that I want you to, because I see we ran out of time, um, is to quickly show you. Yeah, it's so also what we, we I, was, I was talking about the training. A new thing now that has come in. Because we saw that a lot of times people are struggling with the board exams, writing it and passing it. And then we because we are such a large firm, our board of directors and Oh, not um, the board that we also are responsible for or that we that we report to started looking at the pass rate of our candidate legal practitioner and then started asking questions to say, sure, this looks a bit bad because it's like 50 percent pass rate or maybe like a 40 percent pass rate. So it looked very bad in terms of you look at, oh, this person is a legal aid shoe. They got 30% for paper one, so which is not acceptable. So what they did now is we have a, a CA Saturday support school. So it says what it, or it, it is what it says, and that is that it is a support school for your board exams, which is done on a Saturday, but it's done virtually. So you don't have to come into the office or uh, you can do it from um, from home. Those 
support school. So it's like two classes on a Saturday, usually from 9 to 11, and then again from 12 to 2. They specifically deal with um, the papers. So on a specific Saturday, for example, they will they will deal with paper one, which is court processes, but specific parts of that. So let's say motor vehicle accidents. Then paper three will be dealt with, but they will do a specific part of that. So, and then they get assignments. The assignments are then marked by the tutors within each local office. So that is a new program that I wanted to highlight that you also understand that when you sign a, a contract of employment in any way, you commit to working Saturdays, but it's a nice Saturday because you can sit at home in your PJs and your slippers and, and attend the, the, the school. The other we also do when you start working there, we prepare you for court, as I said, and then also we do a little induction, a week in, a week long induction. When you start, we a part of that is an HR induction. So we also tell you about the HR policies of legal aid. Again, how do you apply for leave? When do you apply for leave? So again, we just don't leave you and you need to find out all of these things by yourself. And during that first week, we have a mood court that we also help you to teach you. Or I always say just the stupid things of sitting down and standing up and who do you call what and when and how. And also nowadays the courts can be very pedantic about how you do you dress so we also it sounds stupid but we do also just raise that and make sure about that that you know how to dress for court mm -hmm. and then mentoring and coaching is part of your of your at your office that you will be mm -hmm. placed at and then the monthly you will also have office training and that our training is not necessarily mm -hmm. legally legal training so it can be but it also can be on soft skills like communication conflict management but that there is no prescribed training program that each office decides on what they train i think and like in my office i've started a program on more on the soft skills because i think everybody is tired of talking about guilty pleas and bail and so we started a program of looking a bit at other stuff so I just want to quickly get to, yeah, so, um, no, this is, okay, no, I just don't, I think I've skipped that now, sorry, let me go back to a previous, I went to, I went to quickly now. If we look at, so the career opportunities or your career path, so you're going to start here as a candidate attorney or a candidate legal practitioner. What we then have Permanent, so that's a contract position. So your permanent positions is then either criminal permanent positions or civil criminal, uh, civil permanent positions. Your entry level positions is then either a, a, what we call a DCLP or a level one civil legal practitioner. So that would be your next step. And once you then in, in terms of in the organization. So once you have now that entry level position, being then also maybe a level one civil or a district court legal practitioner, thereafter you can then go. So you can either decide you want to go into management or you want to stay in the legal path. So let's use the criminal one for now. So if you then start off with a district court legal practitioner, you have five years then you stay in that position for five years there's positions available you can move up into a regional court legal practitioner once you've met that requirement you can one that, that's 10 years and i'm talking under correction you can move up into what we call a high court legal practitioner that does criminal trials and, and appeals in the high court so that is a route you can follow in terms of criminal law then in terms of civil, once you have a level one position, you can move into a level two positions. And then again, in your Pretoria, Johannesburg, your bigger offices, they have high court unit civil practitioners. So you can go into that route also. If you then after a while say, oh no, management is for me, you can then also go into middle management, then 
your more your executive levels. So that is also something um, that that you can consider. So that is more or less the path. There's also some of these positions are very limited in, so let's say I look to commercial crimes legal practitioner and not all courts have commercial crimes court. Pretoria, Johannesburg have, they've now opened one up in Germiston. So you, and that's going to only be once you admit it, you are an attorney, then you can be placed in the commercial crimes court. The same with the sexual offences courts, they're not in every court, only some courts have dedicated sexual offences courts. Again, something be very careful, you deal really with rape every day, whole day, and a lot of times it's your victims will be minors, so you'll be cross-examining children and dealing with lots of yucky J88s um, and things. So be careful also if you say, okay, this is something I want to do, think carefully about that. So that, oh, that is more or less the career path um, for if you want into, into legal aid. Then I'm sure Hazel and the other ladies will share all of this, but here yeah, I've already given you the, the web page that you can go and you will find the vacancies and the application process there. And then, oh, I wasn't lying. So it's 60% and you must have your LLB. You do a assessment and you go for an interview. And those then are all the checks we do, a credit check, a criminal check. We verify your qualifications and then we will also ask you for references that we can call um, to, or not character reference, that's not the wrong word, just to references on if you say you worked at the, that you actually work there. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Okay, um, Lisa, we went way over, I see, the time, <laughs> well, um, but I'm glad, yeah, yeah no, I'm glad that everybody had an opportunity to ask. Um, anonymous, I think the last question now was 12.25. I did explain that, um, that there's, once you've been successful, yes, open February, but then once February that's over, they will then start with the working through the applications. If you're then successful, you'll be called for, uh, you'll do an online assessment and you're called for interviews. Then your name is placed in a pool of successful candidates. And then you are called for placement only once there is a position open. And, and that can be July or August. So that's difficult for me to, to give you a time indication. Thank you, Advocate Nivert. I think uh, people have exhausted the questions. <laughs> Nothing else that came through. I was just curious, um, you shared with us, you know, your vetting process. Um, does Legal Aid ISA ever check um, candidates uh, like their social media or, or is that not part of your vetting process? Um, I didn't, and as far as I know, not. No, okay. no they don't, no. So I was, I was just curious about that. <laughs> uh, not yet, maybe I must say not yet, because <laughs> I know the uh, the idea of social media and, and seeing what, um, I suppose, because I think a lot of some organisations, to see if you're a cultural fit, they go and see what kind of things you say on Twitter and Facebook, and I suppose that, that can be an important, um, you know, consideration, but no, for us, no, we don't. <clears throat> I think that brings us to the end of the session. Um, just from our side, uh, we want to invite all of you who attended. Um, if you would want to ask any further questions and also just to share with us your experience of today's presentation. What did you learn? What else do you need to know? So we've got our email addresses there on the screen. Um, this is Manda Makanya as well as myself. And then we will also be posting a recording of this presentation on our YouTube channel. Um, youtube.com forward slash UNISA careers and then just for all of you who are attending and may not know about the virtual grad expo yet um, tomorrow will be the last um, event for this year and basically the event is about you being able then to connect with possible employers also in the legal field 
um, in an online environment where you'd be able to ask questions, where you'd be able to read um, and listen to presentations about opportunities that are available at different companies. Um, information and a link to register for the event is available on my UNISA. Then also just in terms of these um, type of career presentations, such as the wonderful one we had this morning, um, we post um, on my UNISA in the events calendar um, further events that you could attend that will help you to um, manage your career more effectively. So our next one would be on Tuesday and that will be about careers in the public sector. So from our side, um, I just want to thank all of you who attended as well as um, the patients of Advocate Neva to share um, all this information with us and also answering the questions. I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, um, Becky Mzorbe. Um, he will just end off the session for us. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Lisa, and good day, everyone. I take this opportunity on behalf of my colleagues, Directorate of Counseling and Career Development at UNISA, to express our sincere thanks to Advocate Nivot for sharing with our students such an important information about the recruitment, recruitment program, career opportunities that you offer as a Legal Aid South Africa. I think you gave us an overview of what his Legal Aid is all about and what you do in general. You also shared about contribution you are making towards transforming, transforming legal aid profession and assistance you provide to legal practitioners. I think your presentation was interactive. Participants were able to ask questions and you answered those questions. And I think it's the first time we experienced such a large number of comments and questions. So as we continue to organize sessions of this nature, we look forward to your continued support and contribution. So once again, thank you so much, Advocate Nivot. It's you, a very big pleasure. <laughs> OK, and good luck also with your work. It's hard work doing it in this environment. So really good luck with that. And yeah, please, I'm always available to assist. Just you know, Isil know where to, Isil know where to find me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Becky. Thank you, Advocate Nivot.